This podcast is brought to you by the Prospect Research Institute, where researchers come to learn, innovate, and connect. I always lead with, we can only find publicly available information. And publicly available information is based on what kind of the status quo thinks is valuable. And especially with a lot of groups that have been marginalized, their activities, their work, what they hold as value is not seen as valuable, but it can be translated to value for nonprofits and for organizations raising money. Welcome to Prospect Research Chat Bites, a podcast by and for prospect research professionals. I'm Jennifer Filla. Today, I'm talking with Sharice Harrison, philanthropy game changer and director of prospect management and research at Loyola University, Chicago. Hello, Sharice. Thank you for joining me today on Chat Bites. Thank you so much for having me. So you are a testament to the power of doing. And I know that that probably didn't happen overnight. I'm wondering if you're willing to share with us today how you arrived at research and then how did you get the confidence to tackle something as wild and woolly as diversity at work? <laughs> well, I will start off by saying, I think just in general, I'm a pretty confident person. So it came naturally. And I kind of fell into research like a lot of people in the prospect development community where you don't go looking for it, but you find yourself there. My first position in prospect research was actually at Howard University. I was hired um, at this point 20 years ago. So I've been in the industry for about 20 years. And I do think that my first position being at a historically Black college university really did help frame how I looked at the prospect development world, how I understood fundraising, because that environment looked very different than every other fundraising shop I worked in after that. That was the, I think, first and only time I ever had a supervisor that looked just like me. The fundraisers looked like me. Everyone did. So it created a space for me to feel accepted and included initially just coming into the industry. And I think that really set a framework for myself thinking, I belong here. This is a place that I want to stay in. This is a place that I fit in. And I kept that throughout my career. So moving forward in my career, working at different institutions, I didn't really deal with diversity, equity, inclusion that much. Um, I had an experience at a place that I worked where it was a part of the mission statement. It was really a part of how we worked. So there were trainings, there were classes we had to go to, there were activities that we had to do. And I was not a fan of it. I was one of those people that said, I don't see how this really connects with the work that I do. I don't understand what the point of this is. What are we trying to get at? What are the goals? So I was highly critical of the activities that we were doing because I felt like there was no grounding in how does this help us work better together? With that experience, I moved on to another position. And during the pandemic, with a lot of the social justice movements, that there were a lot of issues that kind of came up and there was a need for my university at the time to understand more about what was happening within our department as far as it came to diversity, equity, inclusion. I had conversations with my vice president at the time about wanting to be included and not only being included because I felt like I had a lot to say about it. I had certain experiences that I thought would be helpful to share and could be utilized. But also I had a negative experience prior with DEI work and I did not want to see that repeated where I was, um, and this was at Santa Clara University. I wanted to make sure that whatever was created there was something that was inclusive. I didn't want anyone else to feel like me. Well, why are we doing this? Why is this here? So I really wanted to have that basis where everyone was a part of creating it and making sure it served the entire organization. Wow. So that that explains the confidence. I mean, it's <laughs> it helps to feel like you belong when you get started. So yes. you didn't have that insecurity from the start, which is wonderful. But right. it also, it sounds like it comes from within for you too. Absolutely. I think I've been one of those people my entire life that if something comes across my plate, I can do this. I know I can succeed. I can meet my goals. I've always had that in my head. So as I move forward in life, whatever is the next challenge, the next goal for me, I know I can tackle it and be successful at it. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. You're a lucky woman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
And it explains your spotlight by the Chronicle of Philanthropy in 2021, where you were talking about your commitment to bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion to your role in prospect management and research. So making it practical to the work that you do. And how did you come across that? Like I, what I feel like I've seen when people want to work on applying diversity, equity, and inclusion to research, they talk a lot about let's collect the data. Uh-huh. But I don't feel like that was exactly your approach. How did you how did you make headway on that? Like, how did you say, okay, how am I going to apply this? What did you do? I think it was always innate in me because even within the prospect development community, I don't necessarily know that there are so many people that look like me. So when I work with fundraisers, we're building portfolios, I'm looking for pictures. I understand what everyone looks like. I am doing the research profiles. I understand what those backgrounds are. And I know that I see a lot of the same. And then when you're sitting in these strategy meetings with fundraisers and we need new blood, we need new people. And so it's thinking, okay, well, you're looking at one very specific demographic all the time. And that may be your comfort zone because that is what philanthropy looks like across many organizations, especially in the United States. And then rethinking, because I do come from a family that has been philanthropic. I remember being a very small child and my great grandfather would talk to me about who he was going to support and how they would be philanthropic. So everyone in my family, we have nonprofits, people sit on foundation boards. It's something that I grew up with. So knowing that people that look like me will give a lot of money if you ask them, if you include them, if you have these conversations and bringing that personal aspect of my background and my life into listening to the fundraisers and talking to them about what's happening thinking, okay, let's take a different look at why your portfolios look this way. And then paying attention to those inherent biases that come out. I've worked at organizations where we were told not to put certain people in portfolios because maybe the fundraiser was a person of color and this very big donor did not like that or do not put these people in those portfolios. Or if I have fundraisers that say, oh, I don't want these type of people in my portfolios and kind of challenging them on that a bit to say, let's kind of get to the bottom of this. And specifically at Santa Clara, the student body at Santa Clara is ethnically, racially very diverse. That was something that we would hear about, we would celebrate, we would enjoy, especially since it is in the Bay Area, which is a very ethnically, racially diverse area, and thinking, well, if we are meant to serve the students here, should the people who are giving to support their programs, their services, understand kind of what it's like to be them? So are we engaging the parents? Are we engaging people who may have had similar experiences to them 20, 30 years ago when the percentages were not as high? So thinking about how that can affect how we're raising money and even through the university itself saying that we are going to prioritize raising money for certain scholarships and certain activities on campus that also made me think more more intently and more strategically about who do we uncover and who do we do our research on. So you mentioned how you would have a conversation with a development officer. And I've heard researchers talking around the roundtable just about gender in the past. And especially when it was all over the news, how women were coming into money, you know, the transfer of wealth was happening and and more women creating their own wealth. And I'll never forget the researcher who said, yes, but they asked me like, where's the money? And I can't point to (laughs) the money. And what she was really saying was they don't show up the same way as, you know, the Wall Street tycoon. Uh, However, that doesn't mean that she doesn't have money. It's that we, when we evaluate for her wealth, we have to do it in ways that may not be as easily quantifiable and may represent more uh, percent passion. You know, she may want to give differently and she'll give more and she'll bring all her friends to give. I mean, this is a good prospect, (laughs) but not knowing how to articulate that. And I immediately thought, wow, what uncomfortable conversations she must be having at work. And she doesn't 
have the language to do it and she doesn't feel empowered to do that. So she's just going to keep finding the men that they want to see. How mm-hmm. do, what, what advice do you have? Or do you have any stories to share? Like, how do you, what words do you use? How do you do it? <laughs> I think that you do have to change the narrative. You do have to explain initially that you're looking for different types of prospects in a different type of way. The prospect development community, our best practices are built around traditional fundraising and major gifts. So major gift donors have looked a certain way over the past X amount of years. It's just recently changing to the point where there are these big spotlights on non just cis head white males who are older. So there's even the age aspect of this, where we're not looking at people who are under this age, where there's so much segmentation that we put ourselves in this box of this is the only way to uncover a viable prospect. When you have to start thinking about just how we exist in society, how do things work? And an example I have is discussing especially people who are immigrants or first generation and those type of communities and communications they have within their communities. It's very different than simply, well, who do they know? Or um, do they sit on boards together? Because that's always a question you will be asked of, well, can you tell me who they know? And even though I do not come from an immigrant community, I have known plenty of fundraisers. I have plenty of friends who do and who talk about that. Oh, when my parents came here, we're friends with all these people because we came from the same community. We were raised together. And yes, we know these other doctors who live over there, but you might not know that we know them because there's nothing on paper that shows that. But being aware that, especially from certain communities, if you know that person exists, from that community, asking them more specific questions that are not just about what are the boards or do any people go to your a religious place? Um, if you have churches that they go to, if there are any community programs that people participate in that may be different than simply the women's circles or things that we may be accustomed to, and also understanding how philanthropy exists outside of the way that we just really think about it and asking those questions and talking to people. So if we have, if you have a large population of someone who is not cis, het, white male, do you have fundraisers that represent that population? Do you have people on staff who represent that population? They are not meant to speak for their entire population, but they have a better idea of how philanthropy probably exists in their community than you do. So talk to them about you know, what does this look like for you? Do you have recommendations? Are there things we could be doing better? Are there things that we should be changing when we're having conversations based on culture and things like that? So it's really redirecting the fundraiser and saying that I realize you're looking for a home value, you're looking for securities, you're looking for all these things. But just because we can't necessarily find them, I always lead with, we can only find publicly available information. And publicly available information is based on what kind of the status quo thinks is valuable. And especially with a lot of groups that have been marginalized, their activities, their work, what they hold as value is not seen as valuable, but it can be translated to value for nonprofits and for organizations raising money. So that's how you have to kind of frame that and work with your fundraisers. It's going to take time, but work with them to help them understand there's a different way to get those prospects and get them engaged and start seeing those gifts. So what do you do? You've got a, a development officer on board with it. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is a good prospect. I'm going to go try this. But now your whole rating system for prospect management is like, give me the number. <laughs> what What do you do? Do you do you put a number based on, you know, your sort of gut feeling for others similar to them? Or, or do you h- how do you do it? They're not rating well electronically. I think taking into account certain things that can depress those numbers. So, for instance, real estate even in very affluent, I'll just use Black American communities that are very affluent, they're always valued much lower than a white community in the United States. And it's, you know, the history from redlining and taking that into consideration that, you know, what does this house look like? What do they do? And how are they moving about the world? 
So maybe this equivalent house may be worth $5 million if it was in a different neighborhood, but it's only showing as 999,000 here. There's still that potential to give that amount. So taking that historical information, looking at comparisons of types of homes with people who are in actual activities as well. So looking beyond just the numbers of, if you're looking at a prospect that maybe is a woman or of a different community and saying like, what are all the data points that we're taking a look at? Maybe just the value of the home, the securities, whatever information you can have, there may be so many other similarities for that marginalized person and someone who has a rating of 100,000 or more that then you can say, yes, there is this equivalency. So I can back up that rating with some data, but maybe it's not the exact number. Okay. That's helpful because we create all these systems and then we're like, but wait, right? <laughs> there's all these things we can't quantify now. So what do we do? <laughs> Before I let you go, I'm wondering what resources every researcher should read, follow, or watch, whatever it is, to continue their education on diversity, especially for the field of fundraising. Right. So I don't necessarily have just one thing. I will start with the APRA DEI data guide to kind of just check to see how does this data live in your system? How can it live in your system? Very, very helpful to get your mind wrapped around what do we have here and what can we start with? I would also recommend there is a wonderful book, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Advancement, A Guide to Strengthening Engagement and Fundraising Through Inclusion. This is, I think the Aspen Leadership Group wrote this book, Ron Schiller, Angelique Grant. Um, that's one of the books that I actually read. I've done some trainings with them. I thought that was wonderful. And last but certainly not least, I would recommend, especially for people in prospect development, Depending on the type of organization you're at, you may have a director, vice president, some type of leader in DEI. Reach out to that person because there are probably DEI strategic plans, goals for your organization, and they've already done a lot of this legwork to say, here's what you need to know to participate in how we're going to move forward as an organization. When I worked at Santa Clara, the, our director of diversity and inclusion was absolutely wonderful. I We couldn't have done the work that we did without him. So I would say reach out to those who are really the experts in the field. I like to say I'm a prospect development professional who really likes to do DEI and help it, but there are DEI professionals who do understand fundraising and can help you navigate what's going on in your fundraising department. So definitely reach out to them. And they're, from my experience, have always been able to help. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. That was Sharice Harrison, philanthropy game changer and director of prospect management and research at Loyola University, Chicago. No one really wants to be biased, but I found it heartening to hear from Sharice that those uncomfortable conversations can be done well and change can happen in our fundraising and advancement offices. I hope you were inspired too. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come check out the Prospect Research Institute's learning community. It's a membership community with powerful resources, great discussions, and comprehensive courses. Check it out at member.prospectresearchinstitute.org. I'd love to have you join me as a member of the learning community. See you there. <music>